Welcome to Boing Boing Video. I'm Shenny Jardin, and with us today, Miles O'Brien. Good to be here. This episode of Boing Boing Video is made possible by WePC.com. Miles, we're talking to you today about uh, some, some really tragic news that happened not long ago, this crash, Air France Flight 447. Uh, you've been following this diligently over the past couple of weeks. What's happening right now? This is a crash that uh, could remain in a mist because uh, half of the Atlantic, half of the parts of the Atlantic extend down to as far as 20,000 feet uh, in depth. Uh, it's not easy for the searchers to do what they need to do to figure this one out, to, to forensically put the pieces together. Do know this though, it was uh, a plane that was headed that night, uh, and, and it was a very dark and stormy night, headed right toward the equator, where some of the worst thunderstorms in the world occur, and they headed right toward a huge towering thunderstorm with many layers of embedded storms inside, and by all accounts, everything we can piece together did nothing to deviate away from that storm, went straight into that storm. Now, what happened there and why things might have failed as a result of that, it's difficult for us to piece together. But we do know this, it was sending out messages on um, uh, a high frequency uh, communications device that it has to essentially notify um, controllers of its position and also to tell mechanics at the base in Paris if there's any problems with the airplane so they can turn it around more quickly. Well, that's the only shred of evidence we have and what we've seen from that data that was sent just prior to it disappearing so there was a whole host of problems going on with that airplane. Uh, all kinds of, uh, of difficulties. First of all, there was a turbulence issue, there were electrical difficulties, electrical failures, depressurization. And um, there is also some indication that, that there was some sort of confusion among the various sensors that gather up airspeed data. And when there's confusion, the autopilot basically says, I'm out of here, and uh, hands the plane back to the pilots. And the pilots are once again in charge, stick and runner style, the old fashioned, instead of pushing buttons. What happened after that, we don't know. But it's possible they got into a situation where they too were confused by all these different airspeed indicators and um, might very well have uh, uh, gone into that thunderstorm either too fast or too slow. So it's, it's a complicated uh, situation. The airplanes are incredibly complex designed to be simple and push button, but when the complexity fails you, uh, you're left in a very, uh, you're left back to where you were, and you may not have, you might be a little rusty, the old stick and water rudder still. They found debris off the coast of Brazil, and as I understand it, that debris turned out not to belong to this plane. Yeah, that was, uh, it's kind of unfortunate, isn't it? It, was a, it turned out to be a, a red herring. There, there was a shipwreck, apparently, I think that is now linked to, and the debris that they thought into the crash uh, is not. So uh, uh, that puts, that really puts them back at square one uh, without even any floating debris to have any sort of sense. And of course, the longer you wait before you even see a piece of floating debris, the harder it is to backtrack rifts and winds and try to figure out where the wreckage might be at the bottom of the sea. So uh, it just gets more difficult as time goes on. You know, when we blogged one of your posts from Truceland about the search for the black boxes, a number of Boing Boing readers wrote in. This, this was actually a very active comment thread. And a lot of people were asking, why don't the so-called black boxes that store the flight data, why don't they float? Yeah, you know, that's a couple things on that. First of all, where they are put in an airplane, they're, put in, they're kind of buried in the back near the tail. They're put there on purpose because that is statistically the best place to survive impact, one thing. And so even if they were able to float, they're kind of embedded with a lot of other metal around it. So it might be very difficult for it to break free. Typically, they're, they're wedged in between other pieces of wreckage. So the possibility of it floating. Somebody said, well, why not put it out of the wind uh, in a place and break away quickly? But then it would probably be a situation where it would be less likely to survive the impact. So it's a bit of a quantity, which brings me to my theory. I don't understand this day and age why you know, it isn't like a space shuttle. Why doesn't every aircraft stream out telemetry in real time, just capture on the ground, essentially putting the black boxes on the ground, safe and sound all the time, giving that kind of data all the time? I've heard people say it's a matter of bandwidth, you know, matter of 
uh, number of frequencies available. I don't buy it, do you? No. And in fact, a number of Boing Boing commenters said the same thing. Like, why isn't there a constant data stream so that it, effectively you don't have to look for a, a tiny needle in a haystack if something goes wrong? Yeah, you know, people say, well, it's awfully expensive to do that. What's the cost of this crash? Can Take away the eye. That's a tremendous cost. But just the cost of the losses, insurance, lawsuits, search, and, and, and the risk that the searchers will take, on and on it goes. If you really started adding up all that weighted against the cost of you know, some kind of monetary screen, airplanes, I, you know, I, I can't imagine this in this day and age, it's possible. It's probably a matter of money. Miles, what do you think the likelihood is that we will understand what exactly happened in this crash? Well, I, you know, this is a very, very tough situation because, um, you know, obviously that flight data the cockpit voice recall, if you can get to it, get to them, with the uh, tell-all. So you'd, you'd hear the conversations in the cockpit and you'd see uh, 150 data streams of information about the airplane, you know, what it's doing and the engine setting, everything else. You know, I think you have to, you have to go back to what is just plainly obvious. This is an airplane, a sophisticated airplane that we get to some of the worst weather Mother Nature off of. That in and of itself should tell you something. Um, was there, a, you know, a, a series of failures that made all that worse? Yeah, that's probably true. But you know, why, why did that crew not continue? Why did they think it was okay to go in that storm? It goes back to that training issue one more time. What, what, what? Did they think they could skirt through it and they didn't really understand how to read the onboard radar with the radar out? It's radar out, shouldn't they have turned around? It's a whole series of issues there, and hopefully we can still get enough lessons out of this to maybe prevent some like this in the future, even though I doubt we we'll have the real granularity, real specific on this, so because those boxes I'm afraid lost to be in this. Well, Miles, we're glad to be able to follow your reporting on this, and, and you can do that at milesobrien.com, uh, truslant.com slash milesobrien as well, and twitter.com slash milesobrien. Thanks for joining us. Jenny, it's always a pleasure. Imagine your perfect PC. Now imagine top engineers and innovators working to make that dream PC a reality. Intel and ASUS invite you to join the conversation about the world's first community-designed laptop at WePC.com.